She specializes in social semiotic multimodal analysis. She is interested in how people use resources such as gestures, face expression, sounds, speech, images, writing and objects to make meaning of the world. Um, she looks at sign and meaning making practices in place in face to face interaction in digital environments, which is close to our talks here with a special attention to inter, cross and transcultural communication. Elisabetta has a PhD from the University of Verona here in Italy. She spent a year on a special research program in London during her uh, PhD studies with research on YouTube and mobile technologies. She's been part of numerous research projects on multimodal and narrative analysis, multimodal literacy, intercultural communication, super diversity, uh, and etc. She's the editor of Visual Communication and she's in the editorial board of Multimodal Communication and Kairos, Rhetoric, Technology and Pedagogy. She's also now the coordinator of Pandemic, uh, Interaction and Communication in the Pandemic and Beyond a collaborative research project gathering academics and non-academics worldwide to develop an understanding of how social interaction and social communicative practices are changing during the uh, pandemic. And this is going to be a focus today. Thank you very much, Elisabetta, for being with us. The floor is yours. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much, Marina for inviting me, I must say, thank you for this very um, uh, flattering introduction too. I must say, I'm very happy, excited, but honored and humbled of being here and for Marina um, for inviting me here. Marina, who will always be Professor Bondi for me, because Marina has been the first linguist in English linguistics that I've listened to giving a talk in back in 2006 when she was invited to the University of Verona to give a lecture to PhD students and I had just enrolled in, um, in my PhD at that time and I knew very little of English linguistics and never would I have imagined that one day I'd be here giving a lecture because Professor Mondi invited me to give a lecture to this wonderful summer school in digital humanities and the fact that we call it summer school has also something to do with the topic of my presentation, the fact that with the times and spaces and places of our communication and interactions have all shuffled up a little. So let me uh, again thanks for the invitation let me just for a second share my screen if you have any issues in seeing my screen at some point because now I'll be I'll be sharing it so I won't be able to see you anymore just shout give me a shout or something so uh, yes our focus uh, today on multimodality and the pan pandemic and how multimodal analysis can help us understand what's happening to our social lives in the pandemic now my uh, talk uh, is half a lecture and half a workshop because the idea is that I'll ask you also uh, to work and, and discuss together. Uh, so for the first part I'll introduce uh, some preliminary observations that we've gathered on changes in our communication and interaction practices because of the pandemic and the related policies that have been uh, enforced. And then I'll ask you to work in groups if we manage to make the breakout rooms work. If not, we've got a backup, backup plan uh, to try and brainstorm and think about how from these observations, anything that interests you in the observations that I mentioned, uh, how these could be turned into research questions and what type of methods and theories you could apply to what type of data to uh, better understand these changes. So pay attention to my observations and try and pick one or two things that you're interested with or you disagree with and start um, because at the end, um, at halfway through of this one hour and a half, I'll ask you to start thinking about possible research questions. Um, 
Now, um, as Marina said, I've uh, started this um, collective uh, initiative, the pandemic, that's called meaning making of, inter and that means pandemic meaning making of interaction and communication. Uh, we've started it as a founding team uh, with um, 30 uh, colleagues internationally, colleagues in multimodal analysis. Uh, each is based in a different country and we cover all continents. I'm very happy about that. Pandemic it's a transmedia space and I don't need to explain what transmediality means here because that's one of the themes of this summer school but it, it, it combines a website and, and different social media accounts uh, together to involve both academics and non-academics so common people or professionals of all kinds in sharing observations and collaborating to pursue understanding of how the pandemic has changed communication practices and what this means for the future of social interaction. Overall, we've started mid-May, so everything's very, very uh, preliminary at the moment, uh, but we've managed in these five months, six months now, to involve over 1,500 people across social media. And from the preliminary observations and sharing of this, of experiences, fears, and concerns and questions, uh, um, we've gathered them and we've, uh, uh, we've published in uh, um, end July a manifesto uh, making meaning in the COVID-19 pandemic and the future of social interaction in um, Ben Rampton's working papers and, uh, and it's from that manifesto that I'll, um, I'll sketch, uh, I'll try to map the changes in communication and social interaction practices. But before going there, because I said it's a team of multimodalists or multimodal analysis analysts, let me go and uh, give you a very quick introduction of multimodality. The first slide will be absolutely known uh, stuff for you. I know multimodality is the combination of different semiotic modes or semiotic resources in a communicative artifact or event. It's the normal state of human communication because monomodal communication almost never takes place or it's rarer than multimodal. Um, it's been taken up and developed by different theoretical perspectives and I'll go through them in a minute. But uh, uh, all these perspectives uh, stem and share four common assumptions. One, that all communication is multimodal, uh, that the analysis focused solely or primarily on language cannot account for meaning as a whole. Each mode or semiotic resources as specific affordances or let's say possibilities and limitations that come out from their materiality and the social history so how social groups different social groups have developed them to fulfill their communicative needs and then all modes concur together each with a, with a specific role to make meaning. So uh, uh, multimodal analysis pay particular attention to the relations, the meaning making relations between the modes that uh, are involved in and the and event, 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 event artifact. Someone's unmuted and should Someone unmute themselves because of the Um, thank you. Uh, so how you do multimodal analysis? Uh, uh, I, it's, it's analysis, so it's, it's an analytical process. There are many ways, but the, let's say the commonalities is uh, that for you start analytically by identifying which modes are um, there in a multimodal text, an artifact or a communication event. Uh, so you, you look at the resources for each mode, uh, the, the, the modal resources in each mode and the functional role that each mode plays in the overall representation. And then you start mapping the relation between modes always in relation with the context. We never forget the context, obviously. And the, the, and the meaning made by the relation of, uh, in each mode is never the sum, but it's more the product um, of, each, um, of each component. It's generally a 
fine-grained and qualitative type of analysis that's all also um, kind of time and energy uh, taking. Uh, so normally data sets are fairly small, uh, but there have been attempts and there are been attempts being undertaken to scope out and, um, and um, handle and manage larger uh, corpora, um, specifically in the tradition of John Bateman uh, at the University of Bremen. And I'll talk a bit later uh, with that. Uh, the type of analysis traditionally the multimodal analysis does is a type of textual analysis. So you proceed normally through transcription, then description, then analysis and interpretation of what you see uh, in a communicative artifact or an event. But it's also more and more often now in, in integrative of other methods, uh, such as ethnographic methods, and more specifically, uh, multimodal analysis then uses the traditional semiotic and linguistic methods for research. So it's mainly, and it started as being observational, you observe the multimodal text, uh, you either observe the text, the disembodied text, like you do in textual analysis, in critical discourse analysis and in corpus analysis, or you observe the participants in a communicative event or how they manage texts. So like you would do in interaction and conversation analysis, but by, by video recording them, because you look at gestures and gaze and body proxemics too, etc. But you can also use multimodal analysis in uh, ethnographic uh, research through involving participants uh, in the research, through interviews, focus groups and surveys and carrying out tasks together with the participants. And it tends to be less logocentric so that also in interviews or focus groups, participants often um, are asked or are elicited uh, responses also uh, by drawing or taking pictures or making videos, for example. And more and more often now, you do it in a mixed method type of approach. So you combine both uh, methods. Um, as I mentioned, there are many uh, different theoretical perspectives through which multimodal analysis have been developed. Uh, I've listed here the ones that are, let's say, that belong to the field of study, uh, multimodal studies, and I've uh, um, pinpointed or assigned marked them through the main, let's say, milestone reference that started, at least for me, that type of uh, theoretical perspective. If each of them has been developed a lot, um, a lot of researchers use integrated uh, methods, picking from one framework and, and the other. Uh, if you are interested in more recent research on each of these methods, because you're interested in using one, feel free to email me after this talk in the future, and I'll be happy to uh, start a dialogue with you and try and look for references too. So the first one I've mentioned here, which is also also the one I use, but it's also the one that started using the term multimodality is sociosemiotics. That, uh, let's say, I'll, I'll mention uh, in a couple of minutes the differences, let's say, um, between the different theoretical perspectives. Each has a different focus and so has developed different tools that um, are needed to respond to that research interest. So sociosemiotics, is more interested in what sign makers and meaning makers do. So in people's agency in relation to uh, social structural uh, conventions and, um, and practices. And so it looks at what um, at uh, single instances of sign making and for social semiotics you never use a sign you always make a sign anew by using a semiotic resource and associating it to your meaning depending on your interest and so social semiotics uh, is interested in um, analyzing representations made um, by people uh, to derive how people position themselves, uh, uh, reshape the power relations, but position themselves in relation to uh, broader social phenomenon to be able to derive broader social trends or to see how the way we communicate, people communicate, uh, relates to broader social dynamics in society. Systemic functional um, multimodal analysis, uh, as the name says, it also started 
uh, with Hallidayan linguistics like social semiotics, uh, um, and with Halliday's uh, systemic functional grammar, systemic functional linguistics. But like the name says, it's more interested in uh, structural uh, and, and, and systematic analysis of structural regularities. So let's say if social semiotics is interested in how a person uses an image to make meaning uh, and how that reveals their own positioning in relation to broader social um, contexts. Systemic functional analysis instead is more interested in looking how um, images change their function in news websites, in, so in investigating patterns of regularities, let's say, and new emerging pr practices. Um, Corpus-based, as I, as I mentioned, the school uh, started by the University of Bremen by John Bateman, uh, aims to uh, broaden, to, to manage larger uh, corpora, and uh, they're trying now also to use, uh, because we know that with language you can uh, you can handle it also with automated uh, means, and they're trying now to use also video recognition to be able to analyze images uh, or pre-analyze images automatically. Let's say that these three um, theoretical perspectives all started by looking at document-based analysis or disembodied, as we would say, representations first. So image and writing, um, for example. Uh, but then they branched out also to look at forms of interaction, uh, while mediated interaction, started by Sigrid Norris, and conversation analysis in its multimodal uh, attention, so from Goodwin uh, onwards, uh, they instead started and started devising tools to to analyze face-to-face uh, um, -face interaction instead first. And then in, in some cases, they also um, poured into analyzing online interaction. So mediated interaction analysis from Sigrid Norris, uh, who worked with Ron Scullin, um, is uh, looks uh, how uh, the unit of analysis is action and how it's mediated through mediated tools or cultural tools and uh, that is semiotic resources conversation analysis we know from conversation analysis analyzing speech but from goodwin onwards uh, there's been more of a holistic approach to how uh, participants in an interaction could construct meaning by using and managing gaze uh, gestures uh, proxemics body orientation and the handling of objects too. Then we have critical multimodal discourse analysis. I won't have to talk much about that because if I'm, I'm sure you're all um, familiar with critical discourse analysis, the multimodal dis critical multimodal discourse analysis uh, uh, extends the notion of discourse and, and the critical investigation of, of discourse and how that shapes society and represents society and manipulates ways of representing, of, of portraying society, uh, uh, not only in writing and in speech, but all, in all multimodal resources. We, there's also a theoretical perspective that uh, uh, comes from the cognitive linguistic tradition, from a cognitive metaphor, from um, Lake of and Johnson's metaphors will live by to, so, to, to get a, a, a big reference that everyone will know. And that's been started by Charles Forceville, and there's a growing uh, number of scholars that look at uh, multimodal metaphors and visual metaphors and metonymies and other uh, forms of uh, uh, cognitive uh, representations. And then finally, but not not least, last but not least, last just in my list is it, sorry for the pun. Uh, it's uh, is geosemiotics started by the Scullins, uh, um, and that combines uh, visual analysis developed by Kress and Verloven of signs uh, in place with an analysis of space and place with an analysis of Goffman's interaction order. So they've brought some of uh, interactional um, ethnography uh, in it. That's, as I said, these are the theoretical perspectives that uh, are more within what K.O. Halloran called multimodal studies proper. But 
uh, multimodality has been taken up by different disciplines and different other um, scholars outside, let's say, the, the community of what I would define multimodal analysts, because multimodality has been widely recognized as a phenomenon of communication. So, for example, uh, linguists in the tradition of translanguaging are using a lot, uh, are paying a lot of attention to uh, multimodal uh, resources uh, in interaction and in, and in, in translanguaging practices too. So this is not reductive of all. I'm, I'm, I don't mean to exclude all the others that do multimodal analysis. What I'm proud of is that all these theoretical perspectives are represented in the founding members of a pandemic. And I wanted that so that to be that as diverse as possible precisely to bring different perspectives and different theoretical and research interests in it. Now, why to get to the, the topic, why the pandemic, uh, why communication and interaction matter in the pandemic. Understandably, research priorities in this pandemic have been others. They're focused on the virus itself, first of all, so in the health sciences, but also in economics for the economic repercussions of the policies of the um, brought about by the pandemic, in the behavioral sciences and crisis communication to see how people would respond and, and react to messages uh, on policies. Uh, and then there's also been a focus, especially among linguists, on how the virus has been represented and, and discourses about the virus and the pandemic. And Rodney Jones has set up a wonderful website, Viral Discourse, about that. But it's also true that the pandemic has unprecedented effects on the ways in which we regulate our social lives. I wouldn't be speaking to you from my house, not even my house, my partner's house through the screen if it hadn't been for the pandemic. In the way we interact with others face to face in our physical environments, in the way we interact with space, and also in the way we go about doing a lot of activities that have been digitally remediated online. And that's because of two needs that have brought about these big changes, two needs that in spite of all the diversity of what's happening in different places of the world and for different people, these two needs have been common and have affected all of us. One is to keep bodies apart because the virus hits the body. Uh, and the human body is the main medium for our relations with the world and, and with others. So when you keep bodies apart, communication, and interaction uh, practices have to change, but also the need of keeping people connected and keep uh, social uh, societies productive. And that's being unprecedented, thank you, thanks to an unprecedented system infrastructure for distance communication that we have now and we didn't have in previous decades. Now for the character of the changes, one is pretty obvious. Uh, the changes have been uh, global uh, in spite of the differences in different spaces, but the pace and level of the spread of the virus has been um, uh, made this global character more uh, perceptible and tangible, but it's also because the virus is one shared danger for all humans, and that's also one of the reasons why the war metaphor for this virus is not really good, because in the war, someone's enemy is someone else ally, while this virus is a threat for everyone. Uh, and so that in spite of different local policies, uh, the keeping bodies apart has been a common denominator and that's been a global way that changes have impacted us in that sense. The, the perception of the global character of these changes is probably higher than in previous times also because we have a live transnational information and communication system, this is obvious, and also we had increased mobility and transnational connectedness. Um, another characteristic of these changes is that they have been totalized They've been the focus of attention for months, not only the virus, but also what we were doing and what we are have been doing has been so that it, people have called it an infodemics. It's been uh, it's um, totalized communication and mass media, social media, but also in our private networks. I don't know about you, but I haven't been talk talking about anything else with the people I know for a good uh, few months. Uh, but also in these months, it's been totalizing also because it's been characterized by huge uncertainty. It's a phenomenon that we didn't know. And so that we've been participating in uh, a collective making sense 
of what was happening, a knowledge in the making. And that's a key point, I think, of why this is a particularly interesting, crucial moment to be uh, researched and investigated. And finally, the character of the changes have been abrupt and um, the changes have been abrupt and pervasive. Abrupt because of the urgency in the need of keeping bodies apart because of the threat. And pervasive because they forced to change our habitus in every minimal basic actions and movements from what to touch, how to touch, how to move in space when we go out, from how to start a work meeting or not, now that's been digitally remediated and how to get out of it. Uh, so that the combinatory possibilities, as we said, we call this summer school, the time, spaces, spaces, places, activities, roles, media and semiotic resources of our communication landscape have reshuffled. So to get a sense of these, um, to organize these observations that have been brought about in this month in, uh, in, in the uh, research initiative uh, Plan Mimic, uh, we've uh, organized them according to the key co five key coordinates of changes, uh, mediation, channels of perception, semiotic resources, meaning making practices, and interaction go order from government. And I thought of making them clear here now because they might be useful coordinates or dimensions of communication that you might consider also in your own research. You might find them useful also to distinguish between media, modes and senses, channels of perception that sometimes uh, the, the boundaries are fuzzy. They're all interconnected but I think it's useful as heuristics to distinguish them to handle data and, and reality. So let's start with mediation. Well as as the first uh, uh, a lot of our social life has been digitally remediated so the metaphor of the bubble that we once used for defining our personal networks in so online environments have moved offline, have moved in the physical environments, have started to surround our bodies as a, as a metaphor. Uh, so that uh, while the physical world has been less ac accessible, has shrunk and has been newly regulated, the screens have become the windows to our world, our means of connectivity. Uh, if you consider we've seen scenes of our own hometowns completely deserted in a, a way that we hadn't seen them before, just because us, our bodies as our medium was not there. And, and that's why they were deserting and we could see them through our screens through that. And that's um, in, in, the, in our physical world, our bodies and our uh, intimate households, our social bubbles are physically, need to be physically separated, but there's also reduced mo mobility, reduced social serendipity, the, the, the chance encounters with others and with strangers and reduced contact. And I'll, I'll, I'll uh, draw from contact in the next slide on the channels of perception because I, in contact I'm using the stem tact that comes from tato, touch. Uh, it's reduced because we can't touch people anymore out the door. It's been very uh, and changing uh, and, uh, though and that's why it's also key to collect different perspectives. Uh, this digital remediation of social activities which was already undergoing for many of us in uh, some areas of activities uh, like work for example. It, ha it is um, uh, however unprecedented in scope and in reach and scope in the sense of the areas of our social lives that have been re digitally remediated and the spheres of life that have been digitally re remediated, but also in the reach because there's many more people now that participate in this digital remediation than before. And in that, the digital divide is becoming even more key in um, uh, drawing uh, uh, thresholds in social inequalities and digit by digital divide, uh, divide, I don't mean only access to technologies, which is key, but also in terms of digital literacy and also in terms of having a physical environment in, uh, how, in our households that uh, allows for the digital remediation, for uh, an ideal digital remediation. But going back to the reduced contact in the audiovisual, uh, Let's go to the channels of perception. Uh, the 
both online and outdoor. And if you've noticed, I, I tend to not to say online and offline because online and offline, uh, you can be offline and digitally mediated anyway. I'm talking about outdoor in our physical environments outside the privacy, the safety of our house. Uh, but in both, uh, there is a primacy now of auditory and visual channels of perception or senses. That's because touch, smell, taste, are not safe anymore outdoor uh, and they are not online they are not afforded anymore online also the embodied co-presence is not afforded anymore uh, while offline the embodied co-presence is distant so we need to resense it or reset our senses in perceiving that uh, in offline also the visual I would argue has an even higher role than the audio when the audio is muffled by masks or at least the audio needs to be renegotiated uh, while in online uh, auditory and visual senses are the only one that I have been, are afforded now by digital technologies at least for the moment but also peripheral vision needs to be screened out uh, because you need to focus on what you see on the screen and, uh, and, and, and ignore what happens around you. Uh, all eyes are on everybody in multi-party interactions, including to yourself, so that it makes you quite self-conscious. It, it requires a lot of attention and energy. There's also, the, the, as I said, split attention between the screen and what happens offline. Uh, what happens in the physical environment. Uh, also the 360 degree hearing that we have as humans that we can use in our physical environments. Instead, uh, when it, activities are digitally remediated, they need the 360 degrees screen uh, sound, uh, uh, hearing needs to be screened out and we need to pay attention only to what comes out of the speakers and the audio is heavily regulated online as we know in multi-party interactions and then let's go to that this um, reshuffling of channels of perception have cons consequences also on the semiotic resources that are afforded or that are more likely to be used and in the way they are used. So again, both online and outdoor, uh, gaze and gesture and mobile movement and proxemics are achieving new uh, prominence and new meanings. Uh, outdoor, when the, the, the face expression is hidden by the mask, many have commented on how they over-exaggerate their gazes when they want to signal smiling, for example, but they also gesture a lot, uh, saying we are becoming all Italians, the, my English friends say, uh, precisely because the audio is muffled by um, the, the mask. Uh, body movements and proxemics have started to achieve new values uh, in the way we move and, and we manage space with others um, of, of uh, outdoor but also online and the re-regulation of sound and speech as I mentioned earlier as um, uh, is requiring different practices uh, both online and outdoor and for this this has huge consequences on the meaning making practices that are emerging that haven't they're not established yet uh, the thing is that a lot of the meaning making practices that we would have established in the past are no longer vi viable and new meaning making practices are starting to arouse so arise so uh, through by uh, using visual input we start planning, uh, detecting body trajectories of others and planning our own body trajectories when we try to keep social distance when we are outdoor, so that I mentioned uh, that it's a choreography of bodies outdoor. Uh, but how we move in space and in relation with others have become uh, indexes or maybe indexes interpreted as indexes of uh, levels of respect or disrespect towards others and also on someone's stance towards the virus, whether they believe it or not, and identity. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, I mentioned silence there with an exclamation mark because that's I think is significant, at least what I've observed here uh, about the fact that channels of perception do not deterministically regulate, determine uh, the uh, semiotic resources used uh, because it, we said 
auditory and visual channels of perceptions are uh, prominent. So you would expect by keeping our bodies apart when we are outdoor that uh, we would be louder with other people. So we would speak more loudly. But that hasn't been the case, at least in the UK where I've lived, except for rituals, clapping for the NHS, uh, or I know singing in Italy has been quite a big thing. Uh, but uh, the, the, everyone's commented on how silent, more silent it was, it's been since the start of the pandemic outdoor. And, and, and that's because I, I think, I, I believe, but it'd be interesting to, to investigate that, uh, that uh, uh, being loud had, uh, this brings uh, the social values that we had from the past, from the before times in terms of practices, being loud was, uh, um, hardly acceptable in many contexts or it was only assigned to certain demographics with the others frowning upon that. Uh, in, in all of that, again, gazes and gestures have been uh, much more prominent. Um, um, but the, in the practices, uh, we've already started noticing some uh, reversed social values of signifiers in, uh, compared to the past, so that um, coming close to someone or being distant from someone have reversed their meaning while coming close to someone was a sign of intimacy. Now it's becoming a threat, uh, an invasion, a sign of disrespect, while being distant might be might have been a sign of being detached and cold and now being distant has become a sign of respect the same is for touch but also things like turning your back I don't know if it's ever happened to you in a, if you are in a narrow street where you can't keep social distance and you need to cross paths with others if you turn your back that in the past meant disrespect to someone now is meant to be a sign of respect and care for the other and social responsibility and that has meant that we need to renegotiate all the practices so that a, a lot of people say that they um, they need to meta comment them they make to make explicit what they're doing and how they're meaning what they're doing. And then there's new signs emerging, like the greetings, the elbow greeting is uh, one of the many. Uh, while the reach of old ones is still with us, even if it, they're not viable. And there's new practices in the making also online. And many have commented of how much you wave when entering a meeting and going out of a meeting. We waved also here when we, uh, when, we uh, when I joined online. Uh, the use of chat and emojis but also the backgrounds of, of people please don't look too much at my background here uh, have started to achieve new meanings and uh, there's been a lot of research on a video interaction going on for, for for a couple of decades now but the fact is that there's an increased number of some makers now than earlier. So these uh, new practices that are emerging are multiplying and fragmented in many different communities. And so it's really worth a crucial moment to investigate these. And finally, the interaction order. Uh, what we are, have been undergoing is a resetting of what Ben Rampton in a comment on the Pamimic website back in May uh, mentioned as a resetting of the parameters of the interaction order and I thought that's a really key um, sentence. Uh, the the uh, domains, what's separated and connected are reshuffled again. Uh, the public and private spheres are undergoing uh, a big uh, change uh, in many ways. Uh, they are undergoing a stark marked separation in our physical uh, environment uh, so that there is a threshold when we cross uh, outdoors, the privacy and the safety of our houses for those who are lucky enough to have a safe household. And when we go out and this threshold has us reprogram our ways of thinking about practices that are no longer viable. So it's a thresh and a how to go about doing things when we cross that threshold uh, in all actions and ways of interacting with others. So that threshold marks also a threshold between past and present, between past 
practices that we had familiarized that are still safe in the house and then we have to switch to these new practices that are still emerging that we are still co-constructing when we cross the door of our house and but inside our houses there's been a merging of public and private with public and pri private invading each other in our digital remediation of activities like the one that we are having here uh, so that every one of us has, has given access but also has had access to private slices of other people's worlds and our own worlds, which we wouldn't have otherwise. And that includes celebrities, politicians, your bosses, etc. And that has is, is generating a lot of um, puzzlement or disorientation, but also in a moment where normativity is um, all up in the air. Uh, so that also the patterns of formality and informality have been reshuffled. You can see very beautified uh, people participating in meetings uh, um, along with very scruffy ones. And, and then you can see pets and uh, partners walking out in, from the shower in official meetings in the background. Um, and by formality and informality, I don't mean just uh, signs, more explicit markers of formality and informality that we always think, but uh, I brushed my teeth before starting this talk. And then I started thinking, why have I done that? <laughs> um, while I'm still wearing my training um, uh, trousers instead, uh, big oversharing here. Anyway, uh, and then this opens a, a lot of an interesting, it, it's a really interesting time uh, to observe. It opens also a lot of questions about privacy. Uh, and one question that I have personally is also what happens to all the crucial uh, fully confidential interactions that have a crucial role in our societies, such as corridor talks between politicians before a meeting or uh, between colleagues complaining about their employer and the working environment so that the, they might be starting taking actions between students complaining about uh, their university system or the course content and how it, and how it works. Uh, what happens to that when so many of the activities are digitally remediated and so potentially recordable and trackable. Um, but also, well, and datafication, which was already taking place, as we know, but that now it has, has achieved an acceleration, but also increased calendarization of our activities, even for the activities that are more informal and for leisure. I was already surprised when I moved to the UK that you would have to make an appointment if you wanted to have a beer with a friend, uh, but you still have spaces for social serendipity, for uh, organic and spontaneous activities planned activities. Now with the re digital remi uh, uh, remediation, uh, everything needs to be calendarized. Um, so also, so there are big questions about the big function of social serendipity, encountering uh, others by chance and talking to strangers and, and interacting with strangers, but also about what the reach of our socializing and personal networks will be. A lot of people in Pamimic uh, shared on the Facebook group in Pamimic, shared their concerns about, uh, especially those who are single, but not only them, about not being able to meet new people anymore. Uh, and for this, we need to assess the gains and the losses, what's gained and what's lost in each of these changes, what adjustments and coping strategies people are making in place, uh, take, um, putting into place, and what the implications for the future now. And it's key to research that now, before things have settled down, so that you can also voice your concerns and start to try and impact on the, on the changes for the better. Uh, so, to sum up, this is a kind of a summing up uh, slide. It's uh, uh, we've been undergoing, and it's a last point that I want to make. We've been undergoing all over the world in different ways, in, for different demographics. Obviously, it's a, a huge redisciplining process where unprecedented uh, global abrupt totalizing pervasive changes in mediation in channels of perception, semiotic resources, meaning making practices and interaction order that's uh, 
produ that's producing a reshuffling of the combinatory possibilities of our uh, social lives. And uh, that has meant that we've been on redisciplining ourselves and we are uh, redis still redisciplining ourselves uh, in how to carry out very basic actions, movements and ways about ways to go about to do things so that the semiotic regimes no longer take uh, hold uh, that we had habituated and familiarized and naturalized. So we so these are starting to be uh, denaturalizing. And that's invested all spheres from work, leisure, parenting, caring, interpersonal, institutional relations. So that what was familiar before, what we had habituated, what we had naturalized before, is no longer viable. But there is no new familiar yet, or we haven't familiarized yet. We are still in the process of these emerging practices and co-constructing and negotiating these practices. Although we might now, after all these months, starting familiarizing or uh, naturalizing certain practices just a couple of days uh, a week ago i think it was the first time that i've realized that for the first time i stepped off the pavement when someone else was approaching the pavement to go on the road to keep social distance and i've realized that only after i've done it instead normally i would think about it uh, but in this redisciplining process uh, moment uh, phase that we are in is key to research because when you have to rediscipline yourself you are necessarily need to be aware so you you achieve awareness of the practices you had familiarized and you start planning and thinking about how to reshape these practices and so there's a diffused heightened awareness and a diffused meta reflection everyone's been talking about it. Everyone's been reflecting about it, about to, to do things, about how things are different now, about what you can do and how to do, uh, interact with others and communicate. So that we are in a key moment where there is distributed knowledge in the making and that's why we wanted to involve also non-academics in this research initiative to make the best of this distributed knowledge that is being made. And it's a key moment to observe the dynamics and the, pro the processes, how people create knowledge in the making and co-create practices in the making. And that's why there's the need to gather that now before we automate and naturalize new practices. So this is uh, the last slide before we can start uh, doing some uh, group activity and group discussions. There is a lot to be known. I've noted here the main features of what um, I, I've mentioned that's interesting to be investigated. Uh, we need to think about what the implications are of keeping bodies apart from each other, of conceiving our social worlds as bubbles, and also if, you know, from the spring the pandemic, the virus will be not uh, a threat anymore. Let's all hope so uh, we can't pretend that a whole year of people reorganizing their practices will not have an effect for the future. Uh, what it means of reshaping activities as digitally, what it means that we have a primacy on the auditory and visual channels of perception and the other senses are ruled out in many contexts, this reshuffling of private and public, but also this increased association of what intimate, of our intimate network as safe and stranger with danger, um, increased calendarization and identification, but also the relation, what's the room of personal freedom and agency and its relation with social responsibility and individual choices uh, in, in respect to individual choices. And as I said, social serendipity and how this impacts different demographics, because we're not all the same uh, in different places. And I don't mean just in different countries, but also I don't know, uh, rural and urban places, but also in people playing different roles in society. Also, what are the new trends, brand new trends? What are the accelerated one and the, the ones that are a U-turn from the past? Uh, looking at the accelerated ones is particularly interesting, like the, re the, the digital remediation of activities or the calendarization of the fewer opportunities for social serendipity, which were already taking place in certain contexts, uh, but now they are accelerated. So there's more reasons to believe that they will stay because it's just an acceleration. But then other practices have U-turns. For example, 
the primacy of the visual. In the 90s, uh, scholars in media studies were talking about a visual turn. Now, in the last decades, scholars had started talking about a material and a sensory uh, turn. And now that we are in a, in, a, in a position where a lot of our senses are not safe anymore, what's happening with these uh, turns? Are we U-turning from that? And one way to do that, as I mentioned, is using Gunther Kress gains and losses to spot what new what the changes enable you to do and what enable less to do compared to the past to see where the possible directions but we need to look at that not only on the semiotic level but the sensory the cognitive social emotional physical political level and what to try to trace the possible implications for the future but also to start collecting and sharing best practices so this is it for now. If we have more time, I'll go through a little bit of what the first preliminary activities in Pamimic in the last five minutes or so. But what I would like now to do is, if Vincenzo helps me, is if we can uh, organize us in different, and I'll stop sharing. Uh, so I'd ask you to, um, discuss in groups of four for 15 minutes i would say and uh, uh to think about from anything that interests you in the observations that i've presented to think about possible research questions and how you would design a research to uh, to try to answer a research question on one of the many things that i've uh, mentioned or others that you might think so start to think about the what theories you would use what method and what data and i would like you to do that uh, while talking in a group, if you could post it on Padlet. I don't know if you uh, know Padlet. I'll stop sharing and I'll send you um, a link in the chat to a Padlet that I've created. It's very intuitive to use. Uh, it's like a whiteboard, basically. And um, and everyone can just click on it and a post-it will appear and you can just type on it. So uh, that's it from me. And I would ask you to go in breakout rooms if Vincenzo does that, because I can't seem to be able to do that. Uh, and I'll see you in 15 minutes. Let's see if Vincenzo can do the breakout rooms. If not, we'll find another way. If not, I'll ask you to do it individually and post it on the on the board and we'll discuss it. Vincenzo, can you? No? No groups? Well then, let's give it a, let's say, let's use this 15 minutes with each of you thinking about that and posting on Padlet. You've all seen in the chat, right? So you start with a research question that takes up one of the observations that I've mentioned, and then try and describe quickly uh, with keywords how you would go about doing it, what method and what data you would use. And I'll pick from whatever you write there. Anyone's got questions on how to use Padlet? I'm using it a lot with my students and I find it quite good. Oh, there's someone who's already done. It's already starting. Obviously, if any one of you wants to start to talk um, and contribute in speech or has any questions in the meantime, we can use this minute also for that.
Oh, well, Federico is mentioning there is something that I haven't uh, discussed about because I focus more on our ways of interacting with others, but definitely, yes, the uh, uh, communication about the pandemic is definitely um, a big, a big topic of investigation. I imagine there's been a lot uh, of uh, research uh, that's been under being undertaken in that. There are research projects on Dutch on um, that the focus on single specific senses mm, to undergoing. There is a big uh, crowdsourced uh, project in cultural anthropology uh, that's looking and trying to collect people's uh, of views and, <clears throat> and feedback on, on, on their interactions. And um, obviously that overlaps a lot with my or the interests in pandemic. I think the uh, semiotic take has a different, uh, uh, has a, a different lens to interpret uh, interactions in terms of meanings and resources and um, and practices for uh, representing uh, meanings that can be uh, usefully uh, useful uh, or provide useful integrative uh, insights to those that anthropology uh, does. Anything else? Oh, what well, are the positive elements that could be taken and kept also when we will start to live with the virus? That's a really uh, good question, uh, Julia. Yes, then also the reduced mobility to uh, about polluting the world. Yes, on the other hand, there's a lot of plastic being used because because of because of PPEs, but also takeaway cups that uh, were being reduced. But it's true. What are the positive elements too? And the positive or negative is also depending for whom and which point of view, right? pandemic narratives screening during this crisis so many narratives yes our roles how has computer mediated classroom discourse changed the interaction and teaching and learning yes that's a big big area of investigation too there's um, uh, the members in Pamimic, especially based in south america are working a lot on that and on this uh on this topic, they've launched a call for teachers, researchers and students to send testimonies, pictures and, um, and written reflections about uh, the, uh, the way the practice has changed by being remediated online. So you can join that if you want, because they are collecting testimonies for that. How is everyday shopping interaction affected? That's a really big question too. There are already, there's a, a project at the University of Odense to which Theo van Leuven participates that looks at online shopping and that carries out a sociosemiotic analysis of online shopping. They got a, a big funding for that last year. Uh, mm. And, and they were already looking at the differences of shopping online and shopping in physical environments, differences, but also the, the overlapping and, and similarities. And I imagine now uh, how, how the shopping practices in physical environments might be changing increasingly more and more. And uh, so that reopens questions about the shopping practices in the physical environments, not only in how we uh, the, the online uh, reshapes our perception and our experience of shopping. Yes, definitely. Um, coach potatoes as, as heroes. Oh, wow. Limits of humor in pandemic metaphors. Yes. Yes, the war metaphor, the hero metaphor, many other metaphors are there. Yeah, and it's a big, big, huge topic of investigation, absolutely.
and yes, all, all the health practices to um, in the UK. Um, health visits now uh, have been done online and I'm really definitely interested in in knowing from uh, doctors and nurses how it feels to uh, diagnose someone to carry out a visit only through audiovisual means. And how that yeah and the, the, then the, obviously the health repercussions in the more material repercussions you know, and social repercussions. Well. Well, there's more to what extent the newspapers tend to much text that is alter nowadays some of news value scholars such as Beth Nurek as well as people involved in media studies focused on the last on in the last decades that's a really on point question does this matching between images and linguistic items affect the way people objects are represented with a qualitative approach and the quantitative approach yes Oh, that's a good one. Interactions on the job. I'm looking at this one at the back. How do the changes in proxemics and physical interaction as well the presence of a mask influence face-to-face -face job encounters? Yes. Ethnography, descriptive and inferential statistics. Survey to professionals, more detailed interviews, observation of actual meetings is possible. Uh, that is a really good thing. The, the, the selection of participants would be key here to get um, an idea of how, you know, that the findings can, what, what the scope of validity of the findings are, uh, depending on the participants that you, uh, you select in which settings. Anything else? You're 70 attending and there's only six, seven posting, post it. That's why I would have done this. I would have liked very much to do this um, in groups. The 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 humor in pandemic metaphors. There's a lot. There's a few researchers I know that are part of pandemic. They're working on memes in the pandemic, and you know memes have huge social roles, uh, and uh, they are. Uh, representative of things that go on in society. We laugh at memes because we recognize ourselves in them. Uh, so that they can, you know, analyzing memes, you can have a, 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 a picture or something. Yes, uh, you can map in a sense, uh, things that go on in society. Um, but also it is a, um, a reshaped picture of society and memes in, in themselves and how they evolve have a, have a key role. So, and the pandemic, I think, offers a, a really great chance to observe transnational dynamics. Um, so, if you want cultural specificities, but also sharedness um, transnationally, no one's mentioned that, but I think for me, for my research interest, that's. The, the thing that um, has um, interests me the most of grasping what's going on in this pandemic, pre precisely because it's global and it's so pervasive uh, that uh, uh, we have a unique opportunity to observe the dynamics provoked by one big event across the, the, the globe. And so the, the different um, dynamics of um, that we would call local, uh, localizing dynamics, um, but uh, the different dynamics of sharedness and, and differences because of different policies, but also of different cultural practices, but also of sharedness uh, across the world. So I was surprised that we, we've um, signed this manifesto in 15, it was 12 of us, uh, again, from different continents, including the Middle East, China, South America, uh, and uh, Europe, and, and North America, and Australia. And, um, and I was surprised at how much we all agreed about the observations that we were making. Although there were some specificities in, we mentioned that um, gaze, for example, is, um, is becoming so uh, uh, such a useful resource uh, when we interact uh, in physical environments that my colleague from Oman, Oman said now uh, uh, get, 
people are starting gazing at each other cross gender uh, in public while gays um, between the genders uh, was stigmatized uh, in society in Oman in the past. Now, if you want, I can see, is there someone else writing here? How do cultural, let's see, businesses communicate or oh, museums um, during a pandemic? Yes, um, that is another big question about, again, digital remediation. A lot of museums have organized um, virtual visits, right? Um, there's some research being done there. Um, Sofia Dimantopoulou pu published an article in our website, Pandemic, on that. But that is a big question, yes. News discourses. Good. Oh, thank you for all these contributions. No. How can we save cinemas and theatres, arts in general? Yes. Um, I'm not sure semioticians and linguists can save cinemas and theatres, but certainly we can um, investigate more on the practices and the values of the practices taking place there, but also on the different practices that are possible now together with artists. Comparative studies between East and West countries, interaction and communication uh, rituals. That's a, another a big uh, topic. Uh, there haven't been in multimodal analysis, there have been uh, since the 50s, since Stuart Hall, I would say, in anthropology and in uh, linguistic ethnography, uh, but those comparative, comparative um, cross-country uh, studies, uh, cross-cultural studies, have also been criticized a lot for essentializing, for uh, having skews in the methodologies and essentializes national cultures as if all members belonging to a national culture would behave the same as the participants that were observed. And so uh, there's been a, a, a re- shaping, I'm sure many of you will know that, of these cross-cultural um, studies uh, in anthropology in recent decades uh, that looks more at the dynamicity or how you perform culture rather try not to reify culture. But these, would, again, the pandemic would be a, a beautiful opportunity to do that, I would say. I'm more interested in commonalities than um, in, in transnational influences uh, than differences, but without acknowledging that these differences are there, definitely. Good. Now we've finished. Oh, social media. How much have social networks influenced the narration of the pandemic and its main actors within the social interaction? This is a huge question, Elena. And uh, I'd really like to start thinking about how to handle that. It's a big, big question. And normally it sounds like a question when you start a PhD, you come to your supervisor with this big question and your supervisor will force you to narrow it down and narrow it down and narrow it down, narrow it down to be able to handle it. But definitely that is a big question and we need to find ways to um, address it. So absolutely. Good. Okay, uh, um, shall we stop here? If you want, I can share with you the rest of the few slides, but then I will open for questions if you're happy with that. Um, I'll just share uh, what uh, we've done so far with Pan Mimic. Uh, that again, as I said, it's all at the very, very beginning uh, because it's been five months now. But the idea is that uh, at the start of the pandemic, everyone was talking about it and I was 
thinking, well, what, what does this, what can a semiotician do? You know, everyone's acting as a semiotician, everyone's reflecting on it, and, and, and everything's constantly changing and so fragmented and, and multifaceted. How can we grasp that? Especially because in traditional research, data collection uh, and times of analysis are very long, while I felt, maybe because I'm impulsive myself, I felt the need of grasping things while they were in the making, precisely because everyone was trying to make, is, has been trying to make sense in the process. And if you compare, and we've, I've started thinking about that, about how knowledge is developed uh, outside of academia. So in our everyday lives, how we develop knowledge that is not the specificity of our discipline is very different from how academia develops knowledge, right? We have long times with robust data uh, to be able to analyze data and then publish findings. Uh, and we relate with uh, what are, what's outside academia as research participants or uh, subjects or receivers and then we tell them the results. While when we get to learn and, and cons construct knowledge in other areas of our life as everyday people, we do it in a live, public, dynamic and relational way by talking to other, by looking at tips and tutorials and things that are online. So we do develop distributed knowledge that has a different process. And I wanted to be able to grasp that uh, through pandemic and thinking, okay, let's start and create that. There are precedents for that. And I think, I'm sure you, you, you are familiar, you've heard about that in citizen science uh, that started in, uh, that's the involvement of the public in scientific research. It started in the hard natural and life sciences. It's been ongoing for a good couple of centuries now, but it's also been approached in the social sciences and humanities, as I said, in anthropology, there's a project that crowdsource sources uh, data on the pandemic, uh, but also now um, uh, Betsy Rimes, in particular Bentes Benson in Sweden, and Betsy Rimes at the United States University of Pennsylvania, uh, have started a branch that's called Citizen Sociolinguistics. If you're not familiar with that, um, just have a read at Betsy Rimes and um, Andrea Leone Pitigala paper. It's fascinating. Um, so you involve non-academics in the co-construction of knowledge uh, and that's what inspired Pamimic. As I said, it's the finding thing is um, 30 uh, people but each of, of us involves other people in their networks, it combines academics and non-academics. The principles are that it's entirely voluntary, uh, it's based on everyone's responsible for what they share, it's based on sharing and collaboration, against competition and everyone's recognized for what they share so that uh, no everyone feels comfortable in sharing no one's scared of of being stolen their ideas but it's also it's we do it through live open public conversations by using the affordances of social media so that they are traceable to and we can they, we keep a record of these conversations there's a website the website is linked to social media uh, the, the social media account we've got Weibo and WeChat in China um, Facebook uh, Twitter Instagram and uh, YouTube um, uh, and now, no limits to the spheres of investigation as I said that we started with these observations uh, as a first phase, and we are in this first phase, it, we invite people to share their reflections, their observations, their experiences, their fears, their questions, but also their best practices. And then we have other steps in mind, but we are not there yet, to try to develop methods for collecting and analyzing the experiences and the data shared, but also to agree collectively with others in uh, who have shared their experience on ways to conduct uh, uh, collective research in more uh, structured ways than just the organic and spontaneous sharing of reflections uh, to try to derive implications for the future, the possibilities, the threats and the dangers, but also to start and provide indications on good practices and policies and to try and shape forms of collection, collective action, uh, actions that try to impact towards positive change. Now, we're still at the first phase and I'll present you what I um, here, the, the numbers. 
So in five months, up to uh, mid-October, we've got now the months of November, uh, we've involved um, over 1,500 people across all social media, websites published 26 articles, got comments, it's got nearly 30,000 uh, visitors. Uh, the Facebook group that's been particularly active in, the, in, in these past months has nearly 1,000 members with 600 posts, 1,360 comments and 9,000 reactions. The Facebook group has been quite active because we've involved our friends and uh, it's obviously a generational also issue, the fact that the Facebook group has been more active than others. Now this table is the table that presents a thematic analysis just a, a, a thematic, not a multimodal analysis, a thematic analysis of uh, um, the, the themes of the, the posts shared in, on the Facebook group uh, only in the first two months. And it's only in the first two months just because, I'm um, sorry, this semester has been so intense that I haven't had the time to carry out the thematic analysis of the other, of these future months. I will, I promise, during Christmas. Uh, but you can, it can give you the, the, the the idea of the breadth of the many uh, themes that are connected, be, be, that, that pose questions about how we communicate and interact during the pandemic. As I said, the other steps, we haven't gone through those yet, but already that, so the reflections and the observations and the experiences um, shared I think that they have a great potential for analysis because they enable us to observe how people, everyday people, including us, uh, develop semiotic knowledge, co-produce and share semiotic knowledge in a, in a moment where you need to reinvent practices. And I'm following Betsy Rhymes in that because for citizen sociolinguistics in Betsy Rhymes, she she looks at people that do talk about language in her latest book that she's published, it's how we talk about language, and it, she treats that as acts of citizen sociolinguistics, because that's how we create shared knowledge about certain social values of how we use language. And it's the same for other semiotic practices. And this has, gives them a unique opportunity to start, to start this branch of research. So, Posts have been sharing requests for advice, links to sources, memes, a lot of memes, signage that they would uh, grasp in their own environment, pictures of their own environment, but they've shared fears, but also observations, tips in the comments, people would give support, would provide different views, would share other links that could be useful, share personal experiences that would reinforce or counterbalance, but also thanks for others to giving tips and saying, oh, I'll use this then, and further observation. The thing that it's transnational is quite, not unique, because it's not unique, but it gives the opportunity of many people to interact with each other across different countries with people that they would know normally and that they've shared only but that interest of observing how communication and their interaction practices are changed. I've got one example, I haven't brought it in um, in full, the, 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 the Facebook group is public anyway, I haven't brought it in full because I, I, I want to ask permission and the co-contribution of those who, who've posted it but a, um, a friend of mine posted something about hugging and missing hugging others and someone else posted about, oh, I've done, I tend to do this now. I approach someone by leaning my head to the back in between their scapulas. And I do that also with colleagues and they seem to appreciate that. Someone else posted that, say, oh, I've done that. I call that the backpack hug. And then another 30 comments came one after the other there. We all started calling that the backpack hug with someone saying, oh, I'm gonna use it. I'm gonna do that. So that's, that gives you a glimpse of how semiotic knowledge in the making can be co-produced and shared by others. Even if in a minimum, you know, posts and comments, uh, you can have a glimpse on observing of how we co-construct knowledge about semiotic practices. And I think I'll stop here inviting all of you uh, 
no one's a young scholar, too young scholar to do that. No one is a too senior scholar to do that, to contribute, to give us uh, indications or to contribute with ideas on how we can go on to do other uh, uh, the other steps in there. And that's it. So you can join. And these are the references, but I'm happy to share the, the, the slides uh, with you if you think they're useful. So I'm done. I've left 10 minutes. Let me, um, oh. yes, let me open perhaps the time for questions. I'm sure that people will appreciate uh, the slides and um, there's, well, there's a number of, uh, of questions. Well, the, the first perhaps, um, well, you, you've, in a way you've already answered, but I'll, I'll read it from Federico. Thank you uh, for your extremely interesting seminar. You mentioned before, I hope you've under, I've understood it correctly, that you're taking part in a project dealing with communication and the pandemics. That was during the activities. I'm curious about finding further information. Uh, about how it's developing, are there any public links to it? You've mentioned, you, you've shown something in case negative answer, when will the results um, be out? Well, uh, Federico, you can join us, you can become <laughs> a mimic, definitely. Um, um, you can contact me and I'll involve you if you've got ideas, but definitely, yes, there's the, there's the link to the website and I, I have it in there in the slides too. Okay, and, and there's another uh, question from Mirandi. Thank you very much for delivering this webinar and sharing your knowledge with us. If I may ask about something that's kind of unrelated to the current theme, but I was wondering whether I could get some input on the framework of website interactivity that you proposed in 2014. Well, thank you, Randy. I'm really happy that you were, that you read my my framework. You know, as, as academics, we never know. <laughs> we write, <laughs> and we never know if anybody will ever read us. <laughs> so, uh, yes, definitely. If you want, you can contact me on an email, and we can start to chat about it. If you have specific questions, or if you want to test it, yes. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Absolutely. Oh, well, lots of thank you. So I'm writing my email, my, my <laughs> email here for everyone who wants to contact me and wants to know anything more on this. Oh, there's lots of people thanking you. <laughs> That is another thing that you know it makes me reflect. I've I've noticed also with my students uh, in class. I don't know if you uh, if it happens there in uh, Modena Reggio Emilia too. That normally when we finish lectures, you know, in a classroom, in a physical classroom, people would just go away. <laughs> they they would look at you, maybe smile at you, or avoid looking at you and go away and now instead my students online at the end of class a lot of students would write thank you in the chat which is similar again to the waving that you wouldn't bother doing you know when you get into a physical environment and instead because it, it looks abrupt you, you and I think it's because you perceive the separation the disembodiment of the experience and you feel that you need to give and that is something I like frankly mm. Yeah, and at the same time, if I can add that, there's a disembodiment, but there's a sort of, um, it, it's like more one-to-one. -one. So people feel the need to be, uh, because after all, what they see on the screen is probably your slides and your little face all through the talk. Yeah, it's true. It's <laughs> and, true. You've got um, fewer distractions in that. Yeah, no, it's that, true. There's, uh, there's a number of things that, um, yes, that, that maybe, yeah. Uh, typical of, of this kind of communication, which may also uh, sort of develop further during this pandemic. Um, yes. Like, for example, the 
the private public uh, um, hybridity that you mentioned, that's typical of a lot of digital communication, but certainly during the pandemic has become... Um, Out of course. Yes, most definitely, as an announced. Oh, more, more for everybody, yeah, mm -hmm. feeling with everybody, yes, it's true, it's true. There are also the, the positives that someone mentioned in the Padlet, just because we've got still five minutes, there are positives, like, again, I wouldn't be able to speak here, you know, or I've been, I've had the chance to give talks in China, and I've had the chance to, we've had the chance now to organize seminars uh, with speakers that otherwise we wouldn't have the chance, and also to attend events mm. but also in, in leisure time gigs concerts etc in a different format obviously and you kind of you have a nostalgia you miss the uh physical interaction uh that you used to do there but you get the chance to participate in events that otherwise you wouldn't because of the mm. online medium so yes, yes there are positives most definitely mm. yeah there are yeah no no you got wider opportunities but yes but what you miss certainly one of the things that you've mentioned quite a lot and I think it's uh, it's part of academic life in particular you miss the sort of serendipity social elements the um because everything's structured everything's planned after all what once you open a channel you can say you can go on but you've decided to talk and you've given yourself a topic and and you've given a structure to the event. You may be overlapping as I'm doing, but <laughs> but you've given yourself a structure. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I remember in uh, 2010 uh, when I did that, um, I did a research on mobile phones together with Gunter Kress. Mm -hmm. And, and the mobile phones that had just the smartphones had just been introduced and they gave me a smartphone because we were writing a book together we, they gave me a, a smartphone that said try it out and see how you know make a semiotic analysis of that and i remember me um seeing the feature of the maps for the first time and started through the analysis i had already mentioned the concern that this thing would uh, diminish the chances of interacting with strangers with the maps with having the information available on our phones it's less likely that you are forced to ask to someone to a stranger for information and directions and so approaching someone a stranger will become a potential threat more and more already from there now with the, this thing that anyone is a potential danger for you any other body that doesn't live in your bubble is a potential stranger for you that's my main concern i must say because that you know inserting mm -hmm. itself within you know also racist you know, nativist discourses that are going on in in, mm -hmm. in 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 the contemporary political mm -hmm. environment it's really concerning about the possibility for social texture that you know don't include the immediate people that you know and you already trust yeah, true. and yeah. that is one of my main concerns yeah so there, there, there'll probably be a lot of need for um retexturing <laughs> yes retexturing is a good word it, it is a really great term i'll use it thank you marina <laughs> retexturing yes <laughs> And I would add another observation, if it is um, if it is possible. Also, the way we um, give um, new definitions or we use new terms. For example, when we the the, the over tendency to use uh, um, social distancing, whereas it is physical distancing. And nowadays, it is acquired uh, through the common lexicon as a social distancing. And so we are conceptualizing something uh, very specific about the social attitudes, which is, I mean, in my opinion, it is dangerous to acquire this practice. And nevertheless, and, and furthermore, there's also the tendency to acquire a lexis, which is not actually what uh, um, what it means. For example, in Italy, we have the tendency to use smart work, which uh, it, it, it is in Italian, it is del lavoro, and it is something completely different from what smart yeah. work uh, uh, 
um, originally meant. So a re retextualizing would also imply researching on these issues as well. A, re a resignifying, yes, you are absolutely right. And funnily enough, social distance was the technical term, you know, it was the academic term developed by, as we know, you know, Edward Hall to, dis to define the distance of public, of acquaintances that were not fami family and, you know, the distance that people would behave as opposed to public distance and personal distance. So when it was introduced in, uh, in, in, uh, in communication for this pandemic in communication policies and crisis communication, it was taken from the discipline to mean you have to keep a social distance. So you have to avoid personal distance to keep a social distance. But then it's being verbalized like everything in, in, in English. So it's become social distancing. And so you have to distance socially, distance from society. And that resignifies completely. And so there's very little that academics can say to, to tell people, no, but social me distance means that and not that, because the, you know, the, the meaning association of, of you need to distance socially has all its impact, like the meaning association of smart working, as if it was smarter to work on the screen than it was, you know, absolutely, you are absolutely right. Okay. Yes. Um, if there are no other questions, I'll just uh, repeat that there's lots of people thanking you and asking for the slides, <laughs> if we can have them. And we thank you very, very much for all the input you've given us. And we look forward to seeing you, hopefully in modern, hopefully <laughs> when in person. <laughs> It'd be nice to hug you. <laughs> and, uh, yes, and it will be a great update on how your study goes on. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you all. And good luck Thank to you. all the PhD uh, students <laughs> and researchers there and your projects. Thank you. I'm Mr. Bye. Wave. Bye bye. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. See everyone.